Hi, it's Lynn Kenny. I'm so pleased that you're here with us to chat a little bit about the love notes. I'd like to introduce you to the love notes, which are in 70 play activities as well as musical thinking. So just to review, musical thinking is a cognitive empowerment strategy. We use music, movement, and rhythm to teach children how they think and learn, helping them gain better control over their approach to daily tasks and activities related to learning and behavior. So one of our goals with musical thinking is to teach children how they think, not simply what to think. We have several tools in both musical thinking and 70 play activities, uh, but today we're interested in chatting with you about the love notes. So just to review, executive functions as far as we think about them and musical thinking are cognitive skills. Since we make executive functions transparent for the children, teaching them exactly what what an executive function is. We call them cognitive skills. What is attention? What is um, planning? What is previewing? Um, we like to really make them transparent so that the children become cognitive scientists, coaching and helping their own brains to learn and behave better. Now when you think about the executive functions, we often include a number of interrelated higher order cognitive processes. These processes are necessary for the purposeful and goal-directed behavior that allows us to be successful social animals. There are many of them. And we've added a few here that maybe you know haven't been previously mentioned by some of the wonderful authors who write about executive function. But in 70 play activities, we teach activities and strategies that do things like enhance inhibition, enhance memory, improve planning, improve prioritizing. We even include rhythm, tempo, and timing as an aspect of cognitive skill development because we've learned that tempo, rhythm, and timing are foundational in children's learning and behavior. So let's chat about the love notes. The love notes are the most loved component of musical thinking. Uh, they developed super organically as we played with the children and you know we were doing direct instruction teaching the children planning and previewing and organization and approach to tasks and uh, I naturally would find that I would you know kind of clap things out like here we go and slowly we started to realize that music and rhythm and timing were underlying all of the teaching we were doing with math and reading. Then I had the good fortune of meeting um, Nacho Aramani through Sheila Allen and Alex Doman and I started reading the music research and said oh my gosh music is so integrally tied to thinking and at tier one we are now working with schools in both the United States and Canada helping the teachers to teach the children the difference between moving quick and moving slow in order to encode and retrieve content in our memory more efficiently. Now, what's the tool we use? We actually use these four sweet little notes. The first is Quick Rick, and if you think in terms of music, Quick Rick is a quarter note. So in 4-4 four, four time, which is a very standard time in, in America and Canada, what happens is you have four beats in a measure. So if you're reading or you're learning your math facts or you're recalling your math facts or you're learning your vocabulary skills, if you're doing it in quick rick, you're recalling it rather quickly. So if I, as an example, um, count with you our twos and I say two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. You can hear that we did two, this is, it goes one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. So let's, let's use Quick Rick to count our twos 
in 4-4 four, four time across measures. So here we listen and we hear 2, 4, 6, 8. That's one measure, right? 10, 12, 14, 16. That's two measures. And so we teach children in very simple terms that there's a difference between moving or learning quickly and moving or learning slowly. And we assign a beats per minute of 85 beats per minute to Quick Rick so that if children are recalling information that has become knowledge, so when you take information like you know how to skip count your twos and then you make it knowledge which is something that's encoded in your brain if you are able to recall it in quick rick at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 what that tells us is that that information has become consolidated into your brain so the short story about quick rick is that quick rick is the note or beat that represents four beats in a 4-4 measure. We call him Quick Rick and he's the quarter note. Then we have Slow Mo. So Slow Mo is terrific as well because Slow Mo is the beat that is half the time of Quick Rick. So Slow Mo sounds like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So you can see that if you're marching or tapping or clapping or snapping in slow mo, in musical thinking we're going at about 50 beats per minute because half of 85 is actually very very slow it's actually too slow for the children to stay engaged around so we make slow-mo 50 beats per minute and we teach the children that when you're counting or clapping or marching or thinking in slow-mo it's a wonderful rhythm for encoding okay because if we did 50 beats per minute counting our twos in slow-mo we'd be two four six eight are you falling asleep don't fall asleep <laughs> but if I say oh my golly let's do our sixes let's do our let's skip count our sixes in quick rick we'd be like six twelve I don't remember because how often do we how often do we as teachers and educators access our sixes unless we're teaching math we're not doing it that often right so we need to either teach in slow-mo or remind our brains in slow-mo remember all of these children are cognitive scientists helping their brains so if we do something like skip count sixes in slow-mo then we can not only encode better but we can also retrieve either previously learned knowledge or newly learned knowledge because it's not quite consolidated it's not quite easily accessible as it is in quick rick okay so slow mo is two beats per measure in four four time it sounds like this one two three four one two three four it's at about 50 beats per minute and if we do our sixes we're gonna do them much better we can go six then we pause right six twelve eighteen twenty four it's much easier and the other thing having just hung out with a few kids doing math recently we really want to verbalize the the words on the beat all right, so if I'm saying 16, 24, I'm really focusing on the downbeat and then that empty space, that waiting time that happens when you're counting in slow-mo, okay? 
I've got to tell you in all honesty, Quick Rick and Slow Mo have changed the lives of so many of the kids that I work with. It's my favorite, favorite concept because it's the most simplest thing. If I'm talking to tier one teachers who are like really busy and they're teaching multiple concepts and they're not just teaching reading and math, they're teaching, you know, social studies and science. If I tell them, if you have children in your classrooms who are having trouble consolidating or learning knowledge at grade level, try to teach them that we encode slowly, we retrieve slowly when we're just learning the information because we want to put it in our brains and take it out over and over again. And then when the information is well consolidated, we'll use Quick Rick. And that will kind of be our own personal cognitive science assessment, helping us understand that we know the information because we're able to retrieve it in Quick Rick. Then we have Thinkerbell. Thinkerbell is our whole note, and she helps us to think things out. So for Thinkerbell, she's one beat in a measure that has four beats in it. So Thinkerbell sounds like one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Now, if you work with children who are excitable, who are impulsive, who have attention challenges, who have disorganized approach to the different activities that they do, such as homework, you can see where Thinkerbell would help you think things out. So Thinkerbell is wonderful for planning. Um, how are we going to approach our homework? Let's think this out. Let's use Thinkerbell. Let's think this out. How are we going to approach our homework tonight? Okay, let's give it another whole note. What are we going to begin with? And so Thinkerbell is a wonderful aid and sometimes we'll use the Thinker, we'll take the um, musical thinking book and we'll cut out the, the different cards and we'll laminate them and then we'll let the children lay them down as they're doing their work when they decide, well, what am I needing now? Am I needing to think this out and take my time? Or am I needing to encode this information and learn it? Or have I already learned this information so I've just got to practice it? Okay. We also have a sign that goes with Thinkerbell, which I'll show you in a different video. But essentially, Thinkerbell has a sign attached to her that says to everyone in her environment, hold on a second please I know you've asked me a question I'd like a moment to think about it then we have best rest so for you musical folks which I'm not <laughs> I'm more of a play folk um, best rest is not a note we know that she's actually the equivalent of the rest sign in the musical score uh, but we made her a note because for many of the children with whom we interact they haven't, they've never really experienced the moment of rest, the moment of let's take some real time out for ourselves, let's stop thinking, let's just start relaxing, let's stop talking, let's stop moving, let's just place our hands across our chests and rest. Now we know some of the recent research in neuroscience as well tells us that our brain needs to rest to store and consolidate information. Now primarily we actually do that during sleep, but there are a few newer studies that show that we also do that in between our learning experiences. So while we tend to just kind of keep pouring the information on the children, oh we've got to do our language arts, then we've got to do our science, then we've got to do our math, if you can allow the children a few moments to, some people call it like taking a brain break, and this, in this case it would be a soothing brain break, like a little bit of meditation, a little bit of yoga, a little bit of Tai Chi, maybe a little bit of just sitting still, or sitting still listening to music. We want the children to understand that sometimes it's important to best rest. Now I just wanted to show you a little bit about how to introduce Quick Rick and Slow Mo quickly and in the books it, it describes uh, this quite well. But as an example, if we're going to teach the children musical thinking, you can start at any entry point you desire. I 
almost always start with marching quarter notes. So even though I'm clapping here for you, I'm marching and I'm marching one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. And we know that that is eight beats in two measures. So if I'm going to introduce musical thinking like to a new school or a new school district, the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to march because children know how to march. They know, and, and it, especially if you use cognitive cueing, you're like one, two, three, four, two, two. They smile. They love it. The synchronicity that goes along in the room when the kids are on the downbeat on the same beat is really energizing. It really activates the brain. So if you're first going to introduce musical thinking, I per, I would my preference would be don't get cognitive, get moving. And the easiest place is just to march. And then once you march, you can say let's slow it down to 3 4 1 2 3 4. And now in a matter of probably 30 seconds, they've learned quick rick, what it feels to move quickly, and they've learned slow mo, what it means to just slow it down. N then next, we generally teach Tinkerbell and Best Rest, but if you just want to use the kind of enco encoding retrieving, quick rick, slow mo components of musical thinking, they're going to change the trajectory of the children's learning in your classroom all by themselves. So just to kind of talk about the research for a moment, we know that from Peter C. Brown, Peter C. Brown is a cognitive scientist who did a beautiful book with some colleagues kind of summarizing the current state of applied cognitive science to learning. And essentially the one thing we need to do to learn is put things into our brains and take them out over and over and over again. And if you think about it, if you're really good at something, let's pretend that you're really good at painting or you're really good at reading out loud or you're really good at knitting one of the things that makes you really good is that you practice consistently often over time so that you're putting that information into your brain and taking out taking it out again you're also often matching motor movement to the cognition so what we want the children to know is that if we do things like administer uh, tests or quizzes to them frequently or if we kind of do the same lesson again and again or if we take a test and then review it together correct it and then take another version of that test they're actually being cognitive scientists they're assisting their brains in learning and that is a great thing as I said earlier we encode, encode generally speaking in slow notes and we retrieve slowly when we're learning information and then the test of is it consolidated is that we'll retrieve it quickly. These are our little notes which you saw earlier. All right now just a bit about the the research. Now in both musical thinking and 70 play activities we reference over a hundred current articles. Um, and they're important articles because what we're finding as we interact with people in the United States, Canada, and the UK is that the motor to cognition or the cognitive exercise literature, while it's kind of cutting edge and new, needs to reach further in the world so that we move away from having children sitting at desks and learning information only auditorially and we have them moving around the room pedaling bikes as they do in Stacy Shoecraft's class in South Carolina while they're learning, um, sitting on uh, BOSU balls or yoga balls, laying on their bellies to learn. It's a wonderful thing to lay on your belly and learn as you're writing. Um, we really want this research to, um, you know, reach, reach far and you can be an ambassador in that way. So a few research-based pieces of information related to the love notes are that one, many people move to learn. 
and when we can establish consistent rhythm and tempo and then layer cognition whether it's vocabulary words history Latin language if we can layer it with some timing with a nice beat do 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 if we layer the cognition on the movement children tend to consolidate more efficiently and effectively. Now do we know that that's true for the entire population? We really have no idea. We're just at the very beginning of the application of this, this science. Um, in musical thinking and 70 play activities we reference a few of Adele Diamond's meta-analyses which are pretty recent. Um, I think they're most of them are after 2013. So this body of work is definitely in the beginning and growing. The other important thing is that we're taking a whole brain approach. If we're always, especially with kids who have learning challenges or distractibility or executive function challenges, if we're always only going through auditory and visual channels while they're sitting, then we're missing a subpopulation of the children who would learn much better while they were moving. We also l use what the brain knows best. Um, your brain is firing in time. The neurons actually fire in time. The cells actually fire and replicate in time. Isn't that amazing? So in utero, the, the entire kind of um, human experience at a cellular level has a lot of rhythm, tempo, timing, and patterns. And so we are trying to build on what the brain knows, what the biology knows in order, in order to en enhance the learning. We are finding, and there is not a study on this, but we're observing with all of our sweet children that it really reduces anxiety. Think, if you're a child with a learning challenge or an attention challenge, and you've spent seven years hearing how um, you need to do this differently, you got another poor grade on test, um, you behaved quote inappropriately in class, you're anxious. Who wants to go to school under those conditions? Nobody. So when we engage the children, we make them cognitive scientists, we let them teach other people, we have them make little videos or sing songs in order to educate others. We're able to move around the defensive brain and kind of um, embrace their humanity and accept them as they are and then tell them if we'd like to learn a little more we have some strategies where we can actually do that and then we really increase engagement with play and I just this week played with a little girl she was nine years old I was engaged by one of her teachers to help her with her math facts and she came in her shoulders were slouched and her head was down and she, we hadn't even met yet and she said I'm horrible I'm bad at math she said I'm bad at math and I said well do you like to play and she said of course and I said me too why don't we just go play and we just played and we bounced the ball and I asked her a few questions and soon we were mirror counting and then soon we were skip counting and we didn't push it we just played and was she willing to come back again? Of course, because we were playing. So another important cognitive thing about what's in a measure, and I've kind of explained this, but it's really interesting how measures of music, and again, I am not a musician. <laughs> I'm kind of a playologist, I guess. That's what I tell the children. I'm like, I don't play music, but I love to play. And so the interesting thing is that Measures of music have a very interesting correlation to cognitive processing. And if you read the, uh, the work by um, J.P. Doss, which we were introduced to by Martin Fletcher, Dr. Martin Fletcher, which has really influenced how we look at learning, what happens is that, as I stated before, there are four beats to a measure in 4-4 four, four time. And we can help use each beat to allow the children to, an ex to experience a part of a thought, action, or piece of educational content. So even though today I've spoken a little bit about math and reading, we've applied this to self-regulation. We helped a, about a, maybe she was about 72-year-old grandma 
um, walk down the stairs, well the, actually the child helped her grandma, walk down the stairs in slow-mo when she was carrying things in her arms. Because the we were playing math one day at someone's house and, and the little girl was nervous because her grandmother was coming down the stairs too quickly holding things in her arms. And somehow the daughter just said, well, grandma, you, you're walking in quick, Rick, you need to walk in slow-mo. So, and we've applied it to self-regulation, calming skills. We have a story in one of the books about a little boy who loved his lizard, but the lizard wouldn't let the little boy touch him because the boy weren't moved too fast. So once the school psychologist or teacher taught the little boy how to move more slowly um, in a way that the lizard was calmed by, and in this case it was slow-mo, then the little boy was able to go to school and touch the li lizard each day because he got at the lizard the lizard's speed of of tolerance really the tempo that the animal liked and then since we learn in sequences in patterns um, with consistency with one two three What's the beginning, middle, and end? What do we do first, next, and last? Because that's really how our brain in this society learns, we're able to use measures and use notes and use musical thinking to help the children learn what executive functions are learn how to apply executive functions and subsequently be able to both learn and behave better with this increased knowledge.